Come on in and have a seat. I just wanted to thank you for being here this morning to celebrate the life of Melvin. Uh, I, I asked Mel a couple times because everybody that I knew pronounced Mel's last name, Govay. When I asked Mel, how do you pronounce your last not, name, he said, Govet. So I said, why do people say go bay? I don't know. <laughs> so what would you like me to call you? And in Mel's fashion, I don't care as long as you call me. <laughs> you know, Mel, Mel reminded me of my grandfather in a lot of ways. You know, there's this, there's this element of storytelling and there's a, there's a line of truth and fiction and a lot of times, I don't know where that line is. You know, Mel often would say, there's so many things just right around us that we can eat. There's ants down by the river. I was down by the river, and I ate a lot of ants this morning. And that line of truth is somewhere in there of, I, I don't doubt that Mel might have been down there eating ants. Because he was, that was Mel. You know, he, he one time told me we were in his backyard, and he's like, that bird's not native. Did you bring your shotgun? <laughs> and I think he was serious. I didn't bring a shotgun, nor would I have wanted to shoot the bird in his backyard, but I, I do think he was serious about that bird's not native, that bird shouldn't be here, but also, no, we shouldn't go and shoot that bird right now. We were, uh, we were here at the church one day in a, a service project, and Mel was working on doors, and he told me, for almost every problem, not just with doors, but in life, a hammer is the solution that you need. <laughs> and that's just, like, that's kind of how I felt about Mel was, you know, there were a lot of problems, but almost everything he could solve. He could put his hands to work, and he could solve almost every problem. One of my favorites, though, was he had told me, you know, just loved going out in the desert, always wanted to go out in the desert, and that's where I think the tallest of tales happened. But he said, there's so much water in the desert. And I said, maybe I'm at the wrong desert? And he said, you just have to know where to look. And that, I believe, for Mel was true, that he could go into the desert and survive indefinitely knowing where to look for water and where to look to survive. Well, let me pray, and then we're going to get started as we remember Mel, for who Mel was, not only to us and to our church, to the Boy Scouts, to his friends, to his family, but as we just remember the life that Mel lived. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you that we can come together, and Lord, not with sadness and grief alone, but with a hope. Lord, that we know that Mel is eternally with you, having believed the promises of the Bible, having a hope that transcended his life on earth. Lord, we just pray and thank you for our time together today that we might remember Mel well, that we might remember who he was, his life here on earth. But Lord, in that memory of his life on earth, that we wouldn't forget that his life eternal has just begun. And we thank you for our time together. And we thank you for Mel's friends and family and church members all being here together today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for, uh, for a lot of Mel's life, one of his closest friends toward the end was Sam Moore. And so Sam's going to come and read Mel's eulogy and have some of his remembrances. Well, hello, everybody. So I'm Sam, more, more or less. You can tell why Mel and I got along. So uh, Melvin Wayne Govette was born in Fresno, California on December 30th, 1942 to Leonard and Violet Govette. Govette is the way I heard it, so that's how I'm going to say it. He passed away on October 1st, 2024 in Clovis, California. 
While growing up, Melvin worked with his parents and his siblings on their family farm, as well as several neighboring farms. He was active in FFA, showing his livestock each year. In 1960, Melvin graduated from Kerman High School. In later years, in his continual effort to learn, he enjoyed taking various evening college courses. Melvin did a variety of jobs in his lifetime. A couple that I know of was the Kerman Cotton Gin, and he was in the operating engineers for 30 years. But the last half of his life, he was self-employed. He did painting and plumbing and other home maintenance work with, a, with and for his wife, Ginger, and several other people. He was actively involved with the Boy Scouts for over 20 years where he taught Scouts survival and other skills. He loved the outdoors and that was where he was the happiest. He enjoyed taking trips with friends to the desert in California and Nevada, particularly Death Valley and hiking the Grand Canyon. Mel is preceded in death by his parents and his wife, Ginger. He leaves behind his daughter, Amy Baker, three grandchildren, sisters, Annabelle Rudd and Sylvia Dean, four nephews and their families, and several cousins, all in Texas. So I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Mel about 10 years ago. Got married to my beloved wife over there, and uh, uh, we, I moved to Madeira, and we started going to a church that was uh, had a room was uh, using a room here and uh, that pastor got cancer and wasn't able to continue anymore so the interim pastor happened to be the guy that ended up marrying us and he said well you guys got to find a church all you guys got to find a church and I'm going to bug you to death until you find a church so I don't want you guys just floundering away so uh we thought that was a pretty good idea. We were just, uh, we were engaged, just maybe engaged. And we thought, well, we better get hooked up in another church. He said, well, since you're here, uh, you should probably um, check out this church first. So we've been here ever since. Uh, so I saw Melvin every Sunday, uh, other days here and there. But uh, I didn't really get to know him until uh, he started um, really uh, sliding because he needed a, a people around him. So uh, I bring him to church now and then. Um, I drove his car home one time from the dealership. Uh, and uh, it was just a pleasure getting to know him. He is quite a guy. But uh, you guys all know that, and I'm sure we'll hear a few more good stories. So. Thank you. And Melvin's sister, Annabelle Rudd, is going to come share some memories and family memories as well. Growing up, there were three of us. Melvin was the oldest, my, and my sister. They were 13 months apart. And then, nine years after Melvin, I came along. So we've lived a very simple life on a, our cotton farm just west of Kerman. And, of course, we had the occasional trips into town, uh, school, church, work on the farm. That was life. Our father passed away when I was 11, and our sister at that time was already married, and Melvin followed soon after. So it was just Mama and I left on the farm. So when I was 15, she and I moved back to Texas because that's where all of my parents' families were. So Melvin got left out here somewhat alone, but I see not really. 
As I remember Melvin growing up as big brother, he was always working, busy with those FFA activities, working out with the cows, uh, driving the tractor on our farm and other farms nearby, always earning money. So consequently, he knew the value of money. When I was about seven, I recall him coming to me with this palm open, showing me a handful of coins. And I don't know where he got this, but it was a great idea. He said, if you read this chapter book of mine, this Lassie book, you can have all this money. His bribe worked, I read, and have continued to to this day. Another bribe, apparently not long after that, he came to me again, handful of money, and said, I'll give you all of this if you'll take the Christmas tree down. <laughs> well, that worked too, because even to this day, everything comes down in our house on December 26th. So he was successful. Melvin was a typical boy, too. He got into situations and he did things that, uh, according to my father, was not wise. Sort of like um, jumping off or possi possibly falling off of the high slide at the elementary school, or jumping out of trees in the, on the farm, and other foolishness that little boys like to get into. But all of those things earned him, over time, three different bo broken bones. Then there's the story related by my sister, so many times, of how we had a jack-o'-lantern for Halloween. And apparently, as she was peering down into the jack-o'-lantern jack to see the light, he doused it with kerosene. And the flame burst up, and she carries a scar on her face to this day because of that. Didn't uh, endear her to him in the least. Then there's somewhat the daredevil Melvin, I guess about age 18, when he bought a motorcycle knowing that our father would absolutely in no way allow that. But he just hid the motorcycle out at his girlfriend's house, which was way on the other side of the area. Um, Papa found out, and I have the picture of that motorcycle to prove it. Our father didn't approve of any foolishness either. He was quite strict. And so I knew that when I was invited by, you know, teenage, 18, 19-year-old Melvin to go into Fresno with he and his friends to the bowling alley, it was not something I should do. But I did. I went with him. And... You know, I had to carry that guilt all the rest through my life about going into such a terrible, sinful place as a bowling alley. Yikes. Not only, though, was Melvin a hard worker, he was a perfectionist. I remember the beautiful two-tone, baby blue, I guess about 1956 Ford that, he, that was his first car, he took me for rides in it, but I knew I better not get that dirty. When we'd arrive where our destination was, he'd pull out a rag, wipe down the interior. It was not going to have a dusty car. And uh, I remember years later on one of his trips to uh, Texas, my husband, our three young boys, and I, rode in his vehicle to see the Texas Gulf Coast to the ocean. Well, inevitably, our three boys wanted to eat snacks in his car. 
Oh, no, came the reply from the front. Oh, no, no, you don't eat in here. Okay, calm down, kids. It's all right. You'll get food. And, uh, of course, when we got to the beach, sand obviously was tracked into the car. Out came his little whisk broom. We all had to battle the sand. That was, you know, couldn't be dirty in his car. And I remember during my college years, I had uh, come here to California to visit. And uh, when he discovered that there was long blonde hair on his immaculately clean floor, I was told in no uncertain terms, any future brushing of your hair will be done outside. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, my big brother was so knowledgeable about everything. I really looked up to him. And machinery, fixing things, he knew the solutions. There was nothing he couldn't fix. He'd see a situation, kind of stand there in his own quiet way, figuring it out, thinking through the problem, and then he'd explain what needed to be done. Here's the steps we take. <clears throat> All of that worked great for his job and home repair projects. But you know, in Melvin's mind, the world and all the sad issues that we see today were his to fix too. His level of intelligence and understanding of all the worldwide situations, all the issues that we see were, was amazing. So many phone conversations that I had with Melvin turned into those long monologues on his part concerning decline of our government and all the sad situations. And I'd listen, and after some silence from me, I could just see him. He would, I'm sure, just shake his head. And he would say, Annabelle, I suppose you're not aware of this. <laughs> I'd just be quiet. And he'd go on to tell me, you need to read this book or that book or this article by so-and-so. You know, he had to fix me too. Sorry, Melvin, I have not done that reading. He'd also proceed to tell about all the horror stories of our so southern border. And of course, he'd ask me about that. Do you have any problems there in Texas? I said, oh, yes, we do. Then I was posed with the question, well, what are you doing about it? Melvin, it's not for me to fix. No, I'm not doing anything. And uh, I could hear him as he'd continue talking, holding back the tears, and he'd relate some bits of those horrors that he had heard about or read about, I'm sure, on the news. He was determined that he could fix all those situations too. And of course, I tried to dissuade him from that. Another thing that Melvin was adamant about was his love and concern for all of his family. When I got married in Texas, he stepped in as, our father, as my father figure. He drove out to Texas to give baby sister away. On all, all his subsequent Texas visits, he was intent on visiting all the relatives, and there were lots, some that he knew and others that we, none of us really knew, but yes, they were relatives, you know, down the way. He'd go visit them, and he'd come away with his little notes, and he'd know that person's family history, the connections to our family, and then he'd tell me and my sister actually scolding us that 
we needed to take time and go visit all of those relatives too. Um, then, some years ago, when his daughter, Amy's husband, passed away, Melvin called, and it had been so unexpected. Melvin called, and he showed so much concern for Amy and his grandchildren. His phone conversations just showed such an intense love for all of them, and he, he had such great compassion for y'all. And I remember he tearfully was pleading with me to please call Amy, write her a card. He said, because it is so very hard for her. And I could just feel the hurt he was going through for his dear, sweet Amy. I had to promise that I would do those things for him. And so, here we are. Melvin's gone before us. And of course, especially today, seeing all of this and going through the motions here, it's, it's very real. And I will miss my brother immensely. I mean, no more phone calls. I'm just so thankful to God that I was able to come out in June, early June, and visit him when he still knew me. First, he looked at me, and Amy said, here's your sister Annabelle. And it was like he was amazed that here I had shown up. And he goes, you came all the way from Texas? Yeah, Melvin, I came to see you. He knew me. He was feeling well then. He was talking up a storm. And we had good conversations on three days that I visited. My consolation at no longer having my brother here to share those family stories and of times growing up on the farm that, you know, Apparent, now it's just the two of us. My sister is dealing with dementia due to Parkinson's, and you know I didn't even share any of this with her because it wouldn't have been understand, understood. Um, my consolation now is that I know that Melvin is now of perfect body, of perfect mind, in that perfect heaven. And it's just so amazingly comforting uh, to know that. Thanks to God for his bountiful mercies to Melvin and to all of us who are still here. I know that one day a beautiful reunion will include each of us. Praise God. Thank you for listening to me. That's most of the good things I was gonna say. <laughs> you stole all my thunder. That was really, that was really thoughtful. I appreciated that. And I, as you were talking, I could just like, I could remember almost all of those situations with Mel, except for his car. You know, I, I'm familiar with his work truck, and his work truck was not clean. Exactly. But everything else, I can. Yeah, I can imagine everything else though. I, I remembered when you were talking about having to educate and and teach. My daughter got stung by a bee out here, and in the, in the spring we have clovers, and there's bees everywhere, and she got stung uh, in, in between our two services. And Mel went over, and you know, we were consoling her and pulled the, the stinger out, and we were talking about bees, and he was telling me how important the bees were and asked if I had any beehives in my backyard, which I didn't have any beehives in my backyard. And from that day on, Mel believed that I hated bees. <laughs> And I don't hate the bees, but the only way to convince Mel that I loved the bees would have been to get beehives, which would have resulted in more stings for my kids. 
And it was, but he wanted to talk to me about the bees, why we needed the bees and how they pollinate. And I'm in full agreement that we need the bees, but he wanted to educate and teach. And he just, he loved to do that. You know, he, he was well read and well watched and well listened. And he knew the things that he wanted to talk about. But one of those things that I mentioned was Mel telling me that there's plenty of water in the desert if you know where to look. And as I was thinking about Melvin and I was thinking about those things, I was thinking, you know, there's plenty of hope in the Bible if you know where to look. You know, Annabelle, you, you alluded toward the end of Mel's life, and Sam did as well when Mel's mind was not matching his body's ability to work anymore. He wanted to work, but his mind was losing its grip on reality. You know, the Bible in Revelation chapter 21, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. Listen to this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. You know, there comes a point in our lives where the former is more true, that the death and the pain and the tears and the grief and the sorrow and the sadness are overwhelming. And then we remember the promises that there comes a point in history, whether it be our history or the whole of human history, that every tear is wiped away, that there's no more grief, no more sadness, no more sorrow. You know, I think of Mel and I think of a servant. You know, the church had an auction one time for our, our missions program and Melvin volunteered to be part of that auction. And he was offering his handyman services. And so my wife and I bought Mel for a, a couple hours. I don't remember what it was. And, but I remember he came over to the house and he said, what do you need? And I had a list of just a bunch of things that I needed to fix that I may not ever get around to fixing. And one of those was a door that was just slightly off, but it was rubbing against the frame of the door. And Mel came with a hammer, opened the door, hit the hinge, said, that'll do it, and then turned and walked away. And so I was like, well, should we test it, I guess? And sure enough, the hinge just hammered in a little bit, gave it enough clearance, and he said, what else is on the list? So I just gave him the list, and he said, all right, I'll be back later. And so he went to the store, bought a bunch of things, and came back, and I think we... I think it was like two hours of work that he had volunteered. He was there for like 10 hours. It was like getting late in the evening. I'm like, Mel, you should go on home. No, 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 I've got, I'm still working. I've got things stuff to do. I'm like, we want to go to bed though. <laughs> Would you go home, you know? But he was just, he was there to serve. He was there to work. He knew that there was a job to be done and he was going to see it through. He, uh, he came and trimmed my grapevines one time and taught me the whole time how to trim grapevines. I had no idea how to trim grapevines except for to cut off some of the branches so that next year there will be more grapes. But he was teaching me where to cut and when to cut and how to cut and just wanted to not only do the work but have that relationship as well to give that that he knew how to teach and teach that to other people. When I thought of the grapevines... I didn't ask Mel to come and do it. He came over and he saw that they needed to be trimmed. And then he followed up a couple days later and said, hey, would a couple days from now work for me to come back over to trim those grapevines? I said, sure, as long as you show me how to do it so you don't have to come over every year and do it. You know, it was that idea of proactive service. He saw a need and he wanted to meet that need. I thought of proactive service, that Mel went out of his way to do something for someone that needed something to be done for him. 
To me, that's a very clear and simple connection because when I think of service, I think of Jesus. In the Bible, Jesus himself says that he didn't come to be served, but to serve others, to give his own life as a ransom for many, to pay with his life the ransom that we all deserve to pay. You know, I think Mel's happy place, if you will, was somewhere out in the desert. Toward the end of his life, he always wanted to go to the desert. He couldn't go to the desert, and he shouldn't have gone to the desert anymore, but that's where he wanted to be. It was a place that he knew that was familiar to him. He offered to take me hiking so many times into the desert, and I did not want to go to the desert. <laughs> But that's what he knew, and it's what he loved. That was a place to him that was peaceful. It was comforting. It was life-giving to, to Melvin. You know, I think of Melvin's happiest place now, and being in heaven, having every tear washed away, having all pain gone, having full restoration of mind and body, there's no way that he would return here. Every time he went to the desert, he returned back. But having gone to heaven, there's no way he would return. This life that we live is difficult. It's hard. And having experienced the joy of heaven, there's no return. There's no coming back now. You know, the Bible talks about all of us living eternally, either in heaven or in hell. The Bible also says that we've all sinned. We've all done things that the Bible says not to do, that God has told us not to do. And what we earn from that is death. The wages of sin, our earnings from sin is death. And as a result of that sin and the subsequent death, we are eternally separated from God. But there's water in the desert if you know where to look. And there's hope in the Bible if you know where to look. When Jesus was on the cross, he was hung between two convicted criminals. And those two criminals on either side of him represent how most of us in life feel. The one of them turned to Jesus and said, if you're really the son of God, save yourself and save us. They he attacked. He had no remorse for what he had done. But the other one looked at Jesus and said, I do believe. The one knew that he had sinned. The one knew that he deserved eternity separated from God. The one that turned to Jesus and said to him, that he is the son of God, recognizing that Jesus was the promised savior, received eternal life. Jesus turned to him and said in Luke 23, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. And that paradise is what Jesus referred to in chapters 21 of Revelation, where the tears are gone, the sorrow is gone, the sadness, the pain and the suffering, the mental anguish, the physical anguish, it's all gone. The happiest of all places. Like those two on the cross on either side of Jesus, how we respond to Jesus makes all the difference. Not only in the world, in this life, but also in the life to come. The Bible's clear that whether we choose to put our hope in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins or whether we choose to reject Jesus determines where we spend eternity. I'm confident that Melvin chose Jesus, that he knew where he was going to go the day he died that he knew that his last moments on earth 
would simply usher in his first moments in heaven, that his ending and final breaths would be the last ones he takes on earth and the first ones that he takes in heaven. You know, the Bible offers this hope to anyone who believes. So Jesus said is, to all who would believe. Most people are familiar with John 3, 16. Right? It's a very familiar and common verse that talks about how God loved the world. For God so loved the world, how? That he gave his one and only son. That God offered Jesus to pay for those sins. To be our salvation. To be the water in the desert. To be the hope for the hopeless. To be the balm for the suffering. There's so much that the Bible can teach us. There's so much instruction for how to live. But without having that knowledge that God offered Christ, that God sent Jesus as an act of love and mercy for people that didn't deserve it, the rest of it's just good moral teaching. But knowing that Jesus came, that Jesus died for our sins, and trusting him with our own need for punishment, trusting Jesus for our salvation is what gives us that hope of eternity. So it gives us the ability to look and say that, you know, my life now is difficult, but I'm not living for now. I'm living for my eternity. You know, of all the things that, that I think about Melvin and the memories that I have, I think the greatest thing for me is that I don't only have to look back at what was, but I can also look from today forward and know what is. That Mel is living his happiest life the most joyful life, the most whole and full life that he could possibly be living because of the decisions that he made while he was here on earth. The Bible says that God offers eternal life to all who believe. If you've never done that or you're unsure, God simply offers you the ability to talk to him. You can simply pray. And ask God to show you that he is real. He's given us his word. He's given us his Holy Spirit that we might know who he is. There's nothing more that Mel would want at this time than for you to know that that is true. This time is Mel's friend Jim is going to come. And Jim has some remembrances and is going to invite some other people. And as Jim comes, I, I just wanted to thank you again for being here. It's, it's, it's a good time to remember. It's a good time for us to stop and take inventory of our own lives. You know, Mel's remembered for a lot of things. What am I remembered for? What will we be remembered for? Come on, Jim. Okay, well, I'm no way the public speaker the last two speakers have been, so, so don't expect too much from that. You can tell by my, uh, excuse me, put that down. You can tell by my notes. But anyway, um, I knew Mel, I'll probably get choked up a lot. <laughs> We've been friends for uh, nearly 50 years. I met Mel. Um, when I first started attending 4th Street Church of God in about 1974-75. And uh, became good friends singing in the choir, at, in uh, community choirs, in church choir presentations and stuff like that. Became good friends. And um, one of the early things I remember about Mel is that if you needed help with anything, he was always there. He helped me put a roof on my house one time. Uh, I hadn't known him probably less than two years by that point in time. So we became really good friends, and um, 
Thank you. That was one of the, my high points of his personality is that if you needed help, he was there to help you, whatever it might be. And he was capable of doing it also. Um, talk about the water in the desert. I can show you where it is. Okay. Uh, the first ever desert trip that we took was in 1980. Mel hadn't been out to the desert before, but I had. But he was in charge of uh, finding transportation. So he borrowed from a friend, a Volkswagen Vanigan, to take out to the desert. And uh, Dave Matrosi is sitting down there. He was on that desert trip. And it was uh, quite interesting because uh, we stopped outside of Tulare for breakfast on our way out there. And we left that. And by the time we got to Tipton, there was smoke coming out from underneath the hood. There was a fire in there. And we got that extinguished, but it had damaged one of the brake lines. So for this whole trip out through desert country, we were in a van with brakes. I forget it was the front brakes or the rear brakes that we had. So we tried to take that thing places you don't take things out in the desert. But uh, God was watching over us, so we didn't have any serious consequences. But we learned a lot. You know? And after that, we took uh, vehicles that were more desert friendly. <laughs> and um, so he, Mel went out to the desert lots of times. Uh, Ray Tepfer is in the audience. He went with uh, Ray several times. Um, uh, Travis Taylor, I don't see if Travis, he made it here. Went out many times with Travis. That's when he got really hooked on serious four-wheeling out in the desert. And then he bought that Toyota four-wheel drive after going out with Travis. I wasn't that adventuresome. We usually drove a little bit of backpacking and stuff like that. But in checking my records, uh, we probably went on over 40 desert trips over the years. Um, probably over 130 nights camping out in the desert. And uh, any of you knew Mel, he never used a tent, except once. We used a tent once up at 9,000 feet on top of the Inyo Mountains where the wind was blowing and it was ice cold. And we were in a tent, and if both of us got out of that low-profile tent, we'd have to wave goodbye to the tent because it would have been long gone. So, so we went, you know, type of stuff like that. And uh, he just loved the desert. Getting out, he couldn't wait. I, I, I basically would plan the trips, and he would be anxious. When are we going? When are we going? So he'd get out there, and he just loved it. We went out probably almost every year he went with somebody, starting in 1980 until uh, a couple years ago was our last trip. And, um, but he loved the outdoors. He loved uh, traveling all around. Uh, probably between the three of us that went out the desert with him, he touched every back trail in Death Valley National Park you can find. He saw almost all of them. He wanted to get out there and see that. Um, he, um, you know, we, and besides out to the desert, he just loved getting out into nature. You know, we would probably 50, 60 of those little day trips up into the Sierras, the west side of the valley. Uh, we would go off together and, and see things for a day, explore, you know, up, uh, Maybe Grub Gulch, which is the old original county seat of Madera County years and years and years ago. Um, could be up uh, Jackass Meadow area, back up uh, along the Mammoth Pool Road, uh, hike to the top of Kaiser Peak, you know, uh, going to Twin Lakes, lots of different places we used to go. Um, he just loved those. And um, it's uh, the other aspect I remember about Mel on all of our trips. Oh, there's Larry Martin sitting back there. Yeah. So, um, he never met a stranger he didn't want to go talk to, okay? Uh, he'd just walk up to a perfect stranger and say, how are you? I'm Mel, who are you? You know, are you native of this area, you know? When, one time we were on a trip out in Nevada, way out in Eureka, Nevada, and this elderly lady was there, and he started talking with her, found out she had born and raised there and everything else. He just was not bashful about visiting with people and learning about their background and things. Um, he, uh, let's see, what are some of the main points? Um, go ahead, those two. Um, it's been mentioned, it mentioned earlier, because uh, I remember my early remembrances with him, is that he was always taking college classes, night classes at Fresno City College to improve himself, learning. And he was reading books all the time and uh, to learn how to repair different things and to fix things that weren't working. Um, in his jobs, uh, in conversation, I don't know that much detail, but it a couple times he mentioned 
He worked as a surveyor's assistant out on the west side of the valley at one time. He also worked on the construction of the San Luis Dam project at one point in time. I'm not sure exactly what he did there. Uh, probably maintenance of uh, machinery possibly because that's what he did when he was working down at the sand and gravel plants down the San Joaquin River and the Merced River. Um, he, uh, one of the other major things about Mel is that he could grow more food in the smallest area than you can imagine, year round. And he gave most of it away. If he had people down the street, he would go down, well, I gotta take this down to this lady that lives two or three doors down, or he'd bring it over here to the church, I know, just, just pass it along. But oh, the best big, huge heads of cabbage, the sweetest, my wife will attest to the sweetest beets that uh, you can imagine, just amazing. Um, so uh, before I ask some, because when I was scoutmaster, with uh, Troop 116. Uh, Mel wasn't too involved yet in the Boy Scouts. Towards the end of my tenure, um, he, I would use him as a relief driver sometimes. He'd go on some of the camp routes in the later years. But in a minute, I'm gonna call up a couple of gentlemen that were scout masters of the troop that he really had some involvement with and more of his scouting experiences that I'm not really aware, of, just a few of them that he would talk about. Uh, but not that many, but um, yep. Uh, before I ask uh, Mark Chadwick and Jerry Magnuson up, uh, I just want to say, um, do my best friend. I'll miss you for a long time, forever. Well, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jerry, and this is Mark Chadwick. Uh, we were both scoutmasters of Troop 116. I was uh, a couple scoutmasters after Jim, and, and Mel was fully involved in the troop at that time. Um, my voice went a little f funny today, I guess, from allergies. But uh, there, were, there were photos uh, uh, going earlier showing uh, some of the scout outings that we went on, and. As Jim mentioned, uh, well, he had the privilege of seeing Mel in a tent. I never did. And he would just lay out under the stars and at most would have a tarp that he would throw over him, and including the time out at, at uh, Bodie, which is on the east side of the Sierras. And even though it was August uh, and the daytime temperatures weren't too bad, but boy, as soon as that sun goes down, it turns ice cold. and. I remember Mel, uh, we were all cold, but Mel had a, a, a water bottle next to him, and that thing froze almost solid during the night because it didn't just get cold down to 17 degrees or whatever for a short period of time. It was down there for hours. And, um, but, uh, and some of the other photos that we're playing and may show again were, um, I, I went through what I had, and, and my wife Kathy took most of them, uh, were Eagle Scout projects, uh, and uh, Mel was right in there, uh, willing to help and, and offering his skills to uh, help the boys accomplish their uh, Eagle Scout rank. And um, uh, my oldest son, Caleb, is here. Uh, he knows well uh, all the contributions that Mel gave to him and the rest of his brothers. and. When a, a young man achieves Eagle Scout during his, uh, excuse me, during his Eagle Scout ceremony, he's given three pins, uh, a, a pin for his father, a pin for his mother, and one or two mentor pins. And uh, I believe all of my boys gave Mel a mentor pin. He, over the years, he couldn't wear them all if he tried because he was indeed a mentor to many, many young men. And uh, one of the pictures, again, that was playing uh, showed Mel teaching orienteering. I, I remember the time up at Eastman Lake. Uh, why we went to Eastman Lake in January every year, but that became a tradition. And uh, 
but we had set up an orienteering course and uh, you can see Mel explaining things to the entire troop. And then there's one where new scout Connor Magnuson is there with Mel and he's explaining things to him in detail. And that uh, typifies uh, the character of, of Mel and, and just, uh, I'm just so grateful for the, the memories and all that he uh, contributed to my life and that of my family's. Thank you, Jerry. Age catches up with all of us, so now I need to put my glasses on. I'm probably going to share some things that have already been said, and hopefully there'll be some things that you don't know. One of the things off the top of my mind is when my parents came out here from Pennsylvania to visit me and my family, one of the first times, Mel and Ginger were able to get together with them. And what they had in common, my father and Melvin, was growing up on a farm. So they had a lot of stories they could tell one another about horses and farming, and they headed off. It's one of the happiest times I've seen my father and one of the happiest times I've ever seen Mel. Although he was in his element all the time when he was able to spend time with the troop. Some of you may know in 2013, um, Troop 116 unanimously nominated Mel for the District Award of Merit. You see, he didn't have a boy in scouting but all the boys in the troop were like sons to him. He was personable, honest, dependable, reliable, and simply put, all things mattered to him. He was a coach, a mentor, and a teacher. He was inspirational and a devout motivator. Most importantly, Mel was humble, and he lived out putting others first. As it was said, he gave several decades to his life, of his life to scouting. And mind you, he gave them unselfishly to the boys of Troop 116 and 118. And all of scouting in the grandest ways. As you know, he knew a lot of things. He read a lot of books. He'd done a lot of things. He accomplished a lot of stuff. So for our troop, he was the skills master. He shared those skills with all the boys. He provided knowledge and instruction to the scouts in areas that simply are not taught anywhere else in life anymore. He was patient and always put the boys first. He continually demonstrated by his actions that the scout oath and law are principles, and instruments, and mechanisms to life's one, to live life's one, to live life in according to the, the way that the Lord provides. Mel was tremendously faithful and reverent, and in his beliefs, they ran deep as he lived out his life and all of his godly convictions. He is an example of what a real man ought to be. He was a man's man. He was a problem solver, an independent thinker, a hard worker. He was loyal. He was dependable. Over many of his years of service, he was given those Eagle Scout mentor pins, like Jerry said. I've got 12, two of them are dead, and I know for a fact that these ones were also given to Mel, to Mel. Plus so many more, like Jerry said, he couldn't wear them all. We honored Mel and Ginger in 2017 up at Camp Chiwanaki. For his long-standing integrity and commitment to the troop and to the boys and the values and principles of the Boy Scouts of America. 
He wouldn't be shy at telling people every time he had an opportunity to go up to Camp Chuanake that he climbed the climbing wall. He was proud of that. And we were proud of him for being able to do it year after year. He's also connected to the 116 bridge, as I mistakenly called it, and got in trouble from a camp in the Sequoia Council. It's not the 116 bridge. Well, it says so right there on the marker. So as far as I'm concerned, it's still the 116 bridge. He, like I said, he was the skills master, and he taught the boys about everything and anything, whether they were required by scouting or necessary for life. One of his marquees was the monkey bridge, building that wherever we would go, and including at camp and all the competitions. We'd usually win, because he saw to it that the boys knew what to do, when to do, and how to do it, and why, and erect that bridge. Numerous projects, tool racks, entrance signs, storage areas, and meticulously clean for being in the Chuanaki dust. Al was able to keep his uniform, his area, and helping the boys keep it all clean at all times. On campouts, Mel made his coffee over an open campfire, cowboy style, which is one of my favorites. And he liked it black and strong. And I mean very strong. In fact, so strong, the spoon stood straight up despite nothing being added into it. He loved to eat miner's lettuce when out on hikes. And being in nature was where he experienced joy and wonder, the wonderment of God's creation. He loved plant identification and without exception during my time in scouting, slept outside under the stars, out in the open and not in a tent. So I too never saw him in a tent even when it was five degrees. He, he, uh, he knew a lot about knots, craftsmanship, engineering, mostly good old-fashioned common sense, practicality, fairness, gentleness, and he was passionate and dedicated to the boys of the troop, for that was paramount for Mel. He was laser-focused on things, and was purposeful and direct. No dilly-dallying around. So he must have got that from his father. He was always considerate and a true gentleman and very respectful. He was an opportunity seeker. There wasn't any problem or issue that he wasn't willing to learn about, study, address, solve, or overcome. He was an astute, lifelong learner, always curious, and insisted on mastering the skills necessary for success. Mel and Ginger, to their credit, as the most wonderful people, supported and wrote letters of recommendations for my wife and uh, my wife and mine, two sons, for military academy nominations. And both have graduated from the Air Force Academy because of the steps that Mel put in investment in their lives as well as everyone else's life in scouting. To some extent, Mel was like a grandfather of sort to my boys. In summary, living out every day and demonstrating it. Boy, the Boy Scout oath and, and promise you know, on my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country to obey the scout law, to help other people at all times, keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. Mel was trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. He was always prepared. He did a good turn daily, and as an American, he abide by the outdoor code to be clean in his outdoor manners, careful with fire, and considerate, and be conservation-minded. I will miss you, Mel.
there's not a lot, I feel like, that Mel hasn't done, that hasn't yet been said. It's a life well lived. Mel touched lives in the church, in the Boy Scouts, in his neighborhood, and half of the things that were said I, I resonate with. Mel bought, brought the biggest head of broccoli over one time that I've ever seen in my life. I looked to make sure there weren't like three of them glued together, you know, and he, he could and he did so much. Well, we've got some refreshments uh, back in the back right through this door, some tables and some cookies and lemonade and coffee. So I'd encourage you to spend a few minutes, uh, come back and tell some more stories, share some stories with Amy and the family and Annabelle. And uh, it's great just to continue to remember Melvin Govett for all the things that he did and all the lives that he touched. Let me pray and then we'll continue to spend time together. Lord, we thank you that we can be together to celebrate the life that Mel lived. Lord, what a, a tremendous and wide berth that his life was. Lord, touching so many different people in different ways and different uh, avenues of his life. I thank you, Lord, that I got to be part of that. That through the church and knowing Mel and Ginger, that, uh, that I was blessed and benefited from that as well. Lord, I pray that we continue to remember his family uh, as they continue to grieve Mel's loss, knowing that, that while Mel is not here, he is not gone, that he is simply moved to a new place, that he is spending eternity with you, pain-free. And Lord, we just pray that that would be the, the hope that we have, the memory that we have of Mel is that he is with you eternally. And Lord, we just thank you for the life that he lived on earth. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here on behalf of Amy and Annabelle, the family, and certainly so many other people. Don't 